is done. The seeding of the field, I mean. We did our best to burn off as many of the weeds as we could. We could have done more, but we had some time pressure. We needed to get the seeds into the soil before a major freeze or snow. Prairie seeds typically require a long period of time in cold soil before they will germinate. I sank a hefty chunk of retirement cash into buying the seeds for more than 100 species of grasses and flowers. Financially, I guess I was reasoning that who cares about retirement if the planet is too trashed at that point to enjoy it. And it's not like our work on this tiny plot of land is going to make a big difference to the climate crisis or mass extinctions that are underway. But in this pandemic winter, it's good to have something to work on that feels positive, that keeps us focused on the coming spring. Our timing was perfect. The next day, we awoke to a thick layer of snow, like a protective blanket over our newly planted seeds. Of course, that wasn't coincidental. We've been watching the weather predictions for a couple of weeks. We knew a big snowstorm was coming, so we seized the moment. And after all that hard work, walking out and seeing the field covered in white was profoundly satisfying. I stared at the snow for a long time. In the spring, hopefully, this will be lush and green. But for now, there's something ridiculously beautiful about the sensory simplicity of snow. White everywhere, cold everywhere, quiet but for the wind, still but for the wind. I've been thinking lately about beauty, particularly the type that triggers that sense of profound wonder. It's a hard thing to figure out. Of course, as a physicist, I feel oddly compelled to try to figure everything out. For example, every time I find one of these gorgeous multicolored eggs in the chicken coop, it feels like such a special and miraculous gift. They're so perfect, smooth to the touch and almost luminous in the way that they softly reflect the light. But if it's the symmetry and near uniformity of the eggs that triggers a sense of wonder, something different is going on when I find myself staring in awe at the silhouettes of the trees against the winter sky. Trees are disorderly, chaotic, textural. There's no place for the eye to rest. There's no simple sense to be made of the visual form. What is it about this that I respond to and that I perceive as beautiful? The shapes are random, a little bit fractal. Maybe I would say that the branches look like veins. They look like cosmic filaments. They look like neurons. And as I articulate these resemblances, it makes me wonder what counts as a pattern and whether recognizing a pattern, a form, a resemblance in tree branches actually is the same kind of aesthetic experience as contemplating an egg. After all, tree branches are not simple and orderly in their form, but something about them is pattern-like, isn't it? What is that exactly, though? And is it present in the form of the tree itself, or is it a function of my metaphorical interpretations? Naive human aesthetics is surely partly about patterns, and patterns in some sense do seem to be a feature of nature. Like, we've found a few of these fossils in the river. The original sea organism would have lived in this place some hundreds of millions of years ago. The fossils are fairly common in this area, and it's fun to look for them in the rivers and streams. They stand out to the eye because they're clearly patterned. Clearly patterned. Not what you would expect from plain, dead stone. So, hmm. Resemblance the fossils have to the pattern of seeds in a sunflower head gives them the name of sunflower coral, although the organism in question wasn't a coral. In fact, I think nobody's quite sure what kind of organism it was. Is the resemblance important? Is there something about this kind of pattern that requires life? Is it just an arrangement that you get when close packing a bunch of similarly shaped small objects? Honestly, I don't know. I'm stuck on the question of whether we can objectively say that it's a pattern at all. I mean, what counts as a pattern? The aesthetic responses we have as humans are instincts to identify analogies and assign value and meaning. When do those judgments result from the structures of the physical universe, and when are they layers of meaning making that we apply to those structures? And right, the point here is to talk about physics. In this video series, I've shown this image a gazillion times by now. It's a summary of the known quanta that make up the things and physical processes around us, according to contemporary physics, according to the so-called standard model, which is a quantum field theory of matter and its interactions. And here too, there are patterns. Like there are three so-called generations of matter. There are six types of the particles called quarks and a corresponding six types of the particles called leptons. And for every one of these, there's an antiparticle with the same properties, but opposite charge. And if you scrutinize their properties, including some of the properties that aren't annotated here, there are all kinds of patterns that account for how we choose to arrange them when we make the chart. And this is what I'm really asking about with all this rambling about patterns and meaning. Have we found all the patterns that are there to find on the quantum scale? In other words, is physics done? And the question is not at all about the visual patterns in the chart that I keep showing. Because underlying the standard model of physics, there's, you know, yarn, of course. Actually, not really, obviously, there's not yarn, but there's a lot of math. 
long equations that make absolutely no sense to most people. And those equations trigger aesthetic reactions. Honestly, when I show the equations to my students, most of them recoil in disgust. But to some people with the mathematics background, the same equations make so much sense that they feel exceptionally beautiful. Like a perfect pale blue egg, or a perfect snowfield field. But then there are aspects of the mathematics that strike some experts as ugly and problematic, because they seem arbitrary, they don't fit that sense of, of perfection. As elegant as the equations may be to some minds, I think it's clear that they aren't the full story, particularly since physicists have not figured out how gravity fits into the standard model. But should we look towards the beauty of equations as a clue towards progress, towards a more complete truth? The crux of the question has to do with symmetry. Symmetry is very important to the mathematics of the standard model. But it's a concept of symmetry that goes beyond what we normally think of when we classify shapes as symmetrical or not. What you see here is the setup for a little educational experiment I did with the two kids who live here on the farm, my daughter and her best friend, ages 7 and 8. I put a bunch of objects on a table and I asked each kid to sort them, based on whether they were symmetric or not. I didn't give them any instruction on what symmetric meant. I said they should use whatever idea about symmetry they already had in their head. Here's what it looked like. The first kid picked up each object one by one and checked it. Her criterion for symmetry apparently involved a finger down in the middle of each shape. These are her piles at the end of the experiment. On the left are the items she considered to be symmetric. On the right are the items she did not. Here's the second kid performing the same task. And once again, the finger check seems to have something to do with it. Afterwards, we compared the pictures of the two piles, and we talked about the decisions the kids had made. For a lot of the objects, the kids both agreed whether they were symmetric or not. The loose ball of yarn, for example, and the various rocks and fossils, those all went into the not-symmetric category. Meanwhile, the geometric shapes and some letters went into the symmetric pile. But some items, like the fake donut, the rubber band ball, and a couple of the letters, were more ambiguous. The children disagreed on whether they were symmetric or not. I asked both kids how they decided if something was symmetric. They explained, in their own words of course, that they were both using the same basic criterion, looking for a special type of symmetry called bilateral symmetry. A shape with bilateral symmetry has at least one axis of symmetry such that across that axis, each side is a mirror image of the other. This idea is what we usually mean by symmetric. And not at all coincidentally, it's a type of symmetry that is common in animal biology. Because symmetry is something we encounter in our own bodies and the bodies of other animals, we're used to the idea that symmetry may vary based on point of view. A shape with bilateral symmetry may not be at all symmetric when viewed with respect to a different axis. So some of the differences in the two kids' piles had to do with whether they had considered all possible axes through a shape or not, or whether they thought that a particular axis was especially important. The two kids disagreed on whether to call this rubber band ball symmetric or not. One kid said yes, because it has an approximately spherical shape. The other kid said no, because the symmetry is not perfect. There are details, variations in color and pattern. Deciding if something is symmetric or not in part depends on which aspects of the object we choose to notice and which we choose to ignore. The letters E and S were judged differently by the kids. They both agreed that the letters lacked bilateral symmetry when viewed in their normal orientation. E, though, has a bilateral symmetry if you choose a different axis. But S doesn't. So then we had a long discussion about whether to say that the shape of an S is symmetric or not. There's no axis along which it shows bilateral symmetry, but it still triggers some aesthetic sense of symmetricness. And there is a way that that sense of symmetricness can be formally understood. This letter S has what we would call a rotational symmetry. Maybe you cannot fold it perfectly in half and have the halves overlap, but you can rotate it 180 degrees and get the same shape back again. Lots of shapes have both kinds of symmetry. A hexagon, for example, has many axes of bilateral symmetry, but also anytime you rotate it 60 degrees you get the same shape again, which is a type of rotational symmetry. Circles have a similar rotational symmetry, but the angle of rotation can be anything. A circle rotated 180 degrees is still the same. A circle rotated 60 degrees is still the same. A circle rotated one degree is the same. I tried demonstrating this idea with a pizza cutter in the kitchen, but then I got distracted by the unexpectedly compelling reflection of the ceiling fan. And then I ended up taking a bunch of stupid phone videos and sort of forgot what I was trying to do. Why do I respond to this? I don't know. I just do. Science is once again undermined by aesthetics. 
Anyway, I had a point I was trying to make, which is that everyday shapes show more types of symmetry than just bilateral symmetry. Rotational symmetry is like those shown by the letter S, the hexagon, or a circle are examples. And that's a step towards understanding the more general concept of symmetry in physics, which doesn't necessarily have to do with shapes at all. A symmetry in physics is a structural sameness that persists, even though there's some kind of change to the system in question. And one reason that physicists find symmetries to be so compelling as clues to the deep structure of nature is because they're mathematically tied to the physical rules that are usually called conservation laws, like the conservation of energy, momentum, or angular momentum. I often emphasize how the verbal metaphors that we use tend to seep into our understanding of physics, but it's worth a side note that the reverse happens too. One reason I like studying physics is because of the metaphors it gives me for the rest of my life. The more general conception of symmetry is one of those. Like, I've discovered that for chickens, as well as for cats, it seems that whatever side of the door you are on, you always want to be on the other side. It's a given. A kind of structural sameness that applies regardless of the specific circumstances. Maybe a conservation law of longing. Physics might not concern itself with the obsession that cats, and chickens apparently, have with doors. But it does concern itself with the structure of space and time, which displays symmetries that animals and people take for granted, but that help to explain a lot of physical reality. For example, Bonbon bon the cat, as she surveys the room, does not need to consider if the laws of physics might work differently over there than right here. If she considers taking a sniff, hopping off the chair, closing her eyes, or pointing her ears one way or the other, she doesn't need to take account of whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday. She doesn't need to take into account that the Earth is hurtling through space at some ridiculous speed. Light and sound and smells and motion, the mechanics of her body and the room, have a sameness through time, a uniformity across different directions and locations in space, and a consistency with respect to the kinds of ordinary motions we might undertake. These empirical facts are described by physicists through space-time symmetries, which are expressed mathematically in a way very similar to how we might mathematically characterize the symmetry of a circle or a square. Space-time symmetries like these are so empirically evident that they are beyond obvious in everyday life. They are ignorable. Uncovering the often ignorable structural symmetries of space-time has given us a way to understand the conservation of energy momentum and angular momentum. And space-time symmetries are a part of the mathematics of the standard model. But the standard model also incorporates a number of other symmetries that are tied more directly to the properties of quanta themselves. For example, I have previously described the empirical fact that for every fundamental particle in the standard model, there exists in nature a type of antiparticle. The fact that there are particles and antiparticles, that there is matter and antimatter, in nature, is something that we can understand as a type of symmetry. In the earlier video, I brought up some issues that I see with the loaded language and the metaphors that we bring to the table when we describe patterns like these. It's not clear why we should characterize particles and antiparticles as anti, as if they are in opposition to one another, as if they are opposites. That piece of the description is not so much about the math, but about human language. But it's hard to deny that there's something real about the pattern of relationships between particles and antiparticles, and their existence, whether you consider their relationship or existence to be one of opposition or not. What I'm trying to do here is highlight a persistent question that's a bit of a chicken and egg conundrum. Which parts of the patterns that we observe in nature should we view as truly there? And which parts of what appear as patterns are things that we impose, for example, through our reliance on metaphor? The success of science, its predictive power, speaks to the real presence of patterns in the structure of the universe. The more we learn about those patterns, the better we are at sense-making and at predicting, even when we're dealing with complex and chaotic systems like the weather. I mean, I know it's a cultural trope to joke about terrible weather predictions, but weather forecasting is so much more accurate now than it was a couple of decades ago, attesting to the way that science as a whole accumulates and interprets the presence of natural patterns. And the equations of the standard model are so much more accurate at predicting the behavior of quanta than any weather forecast is at predicting snow. The predictive power of the math for explaining how particles behave in accelerator experiments and how they behave in technologies is profound, because symmetry, the recognition that consistent, simple patterns underlie a range of different phenomena, is so profoundly embedded in the math, physics tends to give a lot of weight to the idea. Several of the biggest questions that have been emphasized in recent decades of physics research have to do with studying the ways that apparent symmetries in the standard model might break down, or seeking extensions to mathematics which, if they're supported empirically, would make it more elegant and more symmetric as a whole. 
But strikingly, while weather prediction has gotten dramatically better in the last couple of decades, very little has changed in the standard model of particle physics. Physics as a whole is still stuck on the same big problems, especially how to make sense of gravity in light of quantum physics, that it was stuck on a generation ago. So it's reasonable to ask, should symmetry be such a major guiding concept? Symmetry in some sense appears to be meaningful in the universe. Some patterns are clearly just there. But maybe the kids are onto something when they figure out that symmetry can sometimes be ambiguous. Like with the rubber band ball. It's a matter of where we focus our attention, or of which details of the particular context are relevant for a particular task. The impulse to find patterns, to sort, to classify, to simplify, is deeply tied to the impulse to make sense of things. And it's an aesthetic impulse. There's a pleasure in things making sense. But sense-making and pleasure and beauty, there's also a lot more to aesthetics than that, like most of what's going on with actual art, which is much less likely to be explicitly about beauty than about things like anxiety or tension, nonsense, power, pain, identity, ambivalence, confusion. I've noticed as I've been making these videos, which are almost entirely based on phone snapshots, that I tend to take pictures that are superficially pretty. Quite possibly, I'd make something much more interesting if I went back and started over with the things that I find ugly, painful, or hard. The, you know, unflattering, accidental selfies. The healing but burnt skin on my thumb that serves as a guilty reminder that I need to be careful not to drink too much wine when I'm cooking. Not to let myself get so caught up stewing about the gender bias and harassment that made me leave the field of research physics more than a decade ago. Or the way that the pandemic has disproportionately affected the working lives of professional mothers more than fathers and grrr. And yeah, you know, focus on the roasted eggplant. Don't burn your finger. Maybe I should show the places in the field where we came dangerously close to accidentally starting a forest fire through the arrogant overconfidence that is one of the uglier common personality traits of scientists and engineers. Or maybe I should show a snapshot of the invoices, indicating how much money we spent on seeds for the prairie, which is just one of so many indicators of the ridiculous economic inequality of the world, the privilege that I'm exercising right now just in order to create a sense for myself, for my family, for my friends, that positive change in the world is possible even in this time of so much global suffering. What an absurd luxury. But then there's an aesthetic to absurdity too. This broken egg is still beautiful, even as it bears the mark of violence, the mark of consumption, the implication of exploitation, and thus an entanglement with ethics. I don't think personally that physics is done. And I certainly don't think I have great insights into the direction it should take. But quite possibly the path forward is going to require a rethink of scientific sense-making. Maybe a rethink of scientific aesthetics that opens up in new ways to the things that currently seem ugly and broken. And I guess, just as I hope that there is some genuine potential for positive change left in the world, I also hope that there's room in the future version of physics for more art, more ambiguity, and consequently for a more ethical, just, and inclusive form of science. <laughs>